uh, Sunday afternoon. Um, Delhi is a very dreary Sunday afternoon, so I'm sure you're all sitting indoors anyway. Uh, welcome to the third Harit Prem Bharat Mahotsav. This is our day two. Um, and I'd like to proudly welcome our uh, celebrated friend and photographer, Mr. Samar Jodha, um, who has taken out the time to talk to all of you today. Thank you, Samar, for being here. We also have Dr. Ashish Malik, uh, who is Director Access College and has been a strong supporter of uh, Prem Jain Memorial Trust and uh, participating in all our Mahotsavs. Thank you, uh, Dr. Malik, for being here. I'll take a couple of minutes to introduce uh, the Prem Jain Memorial Trust to those who uh, are not aware. We created this trust in 2018 in the memory of Dr. Prem Jain, who's known as the father of the green building movement in India. He was a distinguished engineer, teacher, and a passionate crusader of sustainability. And his dream was to have one square foot for every Indian and to make Bharat green, his beloved Bharat green. Um, that's how his journey in the green building movement began, started with 20,000 square feet. Today, we are at 7.75 billion square feet in India. And next year, we're gonna hit 10 billion. So we're number two in the world after the US. Uh, that has been the journey of the green building movement in India. Um, we celebrate the Harit Prem Bharat Mahotsav in his memory uh, from the 23rd to the 29th of January every year. This is our third edition. And it is our hope to engage students, um, young people, people of all ages, all um, cities, all segments, all groups to continue and this mission of making the world green. After COVID, I think we all realize how important it is to nurture the planet, to worry about what is going to happen. You know, if we don't look after, there isn't going to be a planet that we'll have or we'll leave behind for our children. So this is uh, the trust small effort this one week uh, to, to spread the message of green. We are this week, we are also having a virtual run. We are making, we're doing green mass competition. We are doing a green art challenge, green architecture challenge. So we are spreading out as much as we can. And, and anybody who wants to join us, more than welcome. Um, you know, we're here with open arms, please help. Uh, I will now pass, uh, before I talk about Summer, I will introduce him a little later, but I will pass the mic to uh, Dr. Malik and he can talk a little bit about Access uh, Colleges and their association and their mission of green. And then I will come back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pile Man. Uh, welcome everyone uh, in the uh, Green Talk series, uh, the day two. Uh, Access Colleges established in the year 2010 with the motto of Tomorrow First. Our uh, chairman, Mr. Raj Kushwaha, a visionary leader, with the six different institutions of technology and management in Kanpur in the 2010. In the 11 years of our journey, we have eight institutions under Access Colleges Kanpur. And in the, uh, we have a 63 acre campus in which we have already 2000 trees plant in our uh, campus. And our plan is to rise it to the figure of 5000 in the coming two years for the green campus. Also, uh, we are working on to reduce our electricity usage through grid by introducing rooftop solar power generation and broad and uh, add to this, we achieve our 80% consumption through solar energy in the next one year. Access always work towards the achievement of sustainable environment. Like uh, Prem Janji, we are also uh, working on the uh, sustainable environment and green campus. So we sign the MOU with PGMT as we are the, uh, we want to be a uh, partner in their journey toward the sustainability. With the PGMT during the Harit Prem Bharat Mahotsav in the 2021, we are doing tree plantation drive on 26th Jan itself and a sustainability talk on 29th of January. In addition to this, our students participated in the green mass competition, uh, quiz competition organized by architecture department and other activities of uh, small pictures, videos, and other uh, green talk, uh, green talk participation. Access students of engineering, architecture, and fashion will always drive the sustainable movement of access and PGMT to help the society. And I all uh, and now I welcome Mr. Samar Jodha and Ms. Pyle Jain, and thanks for giving this opportunity to access so that uh, we will work together in the sustainable environment. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Dr. Malik. Uh, I, and thank you, Samar. Thank you for waiting. I don't think Samar Joda needs an introduction, but uh, all the same, I will. And most people who are here have heard of him, seen his work, know of uh, how amazing he has been over the last three decades. Um, I would like to tell those who do not know him that he's a photographer and installation artist who has worked for the last three decades using photography, film, and public art projects to address various issues like community development and conservation. His work has been widely published and shown on public art platforms all over the world. He's also a very well-known TED speaker. He has done TEDx, including TEDx Vienna, on the artist's role in sustainability and capacity building. Summer is invested deeply in the youth and believes that the youth have the power to lead and enable social impact. And that is how PJMT and um, his Red Balloon Foundation come together. He is the founder of Red Balloon, an organization based on collaborative ecosystems to create large scale mobilization and impact with art and design at its core. The Red Balloon builds partnerships with children of all ages and backgrounds, raising awareness on critical issues and enabling individual leadership to bring change. Some of his iconic works like the Bhopal, a silent picture is a multimedia installation which documents the aftermath of his Bhopal gas tragedy of 1984. It's housed in a 40 foot container and has visited locations all over the world. I don't know how you have done this summer, but it is really, really commendable. Um, the most iconic location has been at the London Olympics. Outpost is a visual dequisition of spontaneous individual expression in a rapidly homogenizing global culture. Discarded containers used as habitats for miners were deployed in a pictorial trope at the 55th Venice Biennale. I'm not gonna to waste too much more time and I'm going to invite Summer now to talk himself firsthand about his incredible work. Thank you, Summer, and welcome. Excellent. Thanks everyone uh, for coming out on your Sunday uh, and not, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I, I keep, uh, thinking that you know the amount of exposure we have on screen uh, hopefully Sunday we kind of take it easy but anyway now you're yeah, here so you have to hear me out my apologies to some of my friends who are here who have probably heard me before uh, so if I'm gonna repeat myself uh, please bear with me uh, going forward uh, you know what we'll do is we'll run a small film uh, which will uh, you know give an overall uh, you know uh, thought of what I've been working and so me talking about it because obviously I come from a space of uh, visuals and films and art and all that. So let me just, if I can have the screen, let's say share, and let me just play something from here. Okay, can everybody hear me? We are good, we are good. All right. has for over 20 years been using photography and film to convey powerful statements about issues like human rights, development and conservation.
sustainability and capacity building to do with an artist. to Sajjad. Okay, uh, we need to talk, I guess you just can't spend whole afternoon watching a film. So uh, let's go ahead, please. Okay, Samar, so shall I ask you some questions? Yes, please. Let me, okay, good. So you started this journey three decades ago when you moved back from the West to India and started work in advertising and fashion. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how it has been? Yeah, you know, uh, especially because, you know, there's a lot of uh, young crowd here, uh, young audience, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge is always about that, where am I going to make a living? I've decided to be in a profession, which is not your conventional thing. Uh, it's not going to be, I mean, even if it's conventional, getting a job today is a tough business. So I, I had the same issues and uh, I got into doing advertising and uh, fashion and uh, commercial photography. But I think after a few years, I kind of realized that it's just not uh, my my bag. Uh, and then I started doing publishing work. So I took that fashion skills and started collaborating with fashion designers, uh, including uh, like I worked with Ritu Kumar on a royal costume book with Christie's, uh, did a lot of architecture books and all that. So I did that for about eight or 10 years. And uh, parallelly, I was, of course, doing my personal work, working with communities and all that stuff. But I think, you know, th there comes a point where uh, you have to really, uh, you know, take that call. Where do you want to go with it? You know, this business of I'm going to do the balancing act. Unfortunately, uh, you know, you're never really honest with uh, any of it because you keep making excuses that, uh, you know, I need to do this so I can do that other stuff. Uh, and I think when people come up with this and, you know, I myself face that, uh, where's the money going to come from? You know, I mean, that's an obvious thing. You know, I don't have a trust fund from my dad or something. I had to make my own living and, uh, you know, create my own uh, system. But uh, I think, uh, you know, I think you need to have 
good clarity. It doesn't matter what you do, whether it's uh, commercial, being an artist, being whatever that is, you have to be honest to yourself. I think that's really, and it's not, I'm not saying that I've found honesty. I mean, it's a process I'm still going through. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, you know, if you have that clarity, it really helps you uh, create those building blocks, you know. I don't think you are somebody who can be accused of, uh, you know, not being honest to yourself. And I remember the first time we met, you had told me about how you're able to balance and how you're able to do all the things that you're truly passionate about and yet pay the bills. And I think that's something you may want to tell our audience about because we don't always, and all of us in creative uh, spaces struggle with that because our heart takes us somewhere and the head is elsewhere and how are you going to pay the bills and you haven't, you don't want to use family or this or friends or husband or spouse's money to pay for your passion. So how do you balance it? How have you done that? Yeah, so I think, you know, there came a point, uh, I think about eight or eight odd years in advertising, I kind of, you know, what really is a very uh, difficult space is when are you prepared to walk away from that money? You know, when are you prepared to, you know, uh, so that balancing thing, you think that, okay, 90 days, I'm going to do commercial work and 10 days, I'm going to do my personal work or art or whatever that is. And, you know, that, that is the balance you need to really know, I think, uh, because the temptations are huge. Money is tempting, fame, name, the lifestyle, the quality of life, all that stuff is extremely tempting. And uh, it's so easy to fall in those traps. So I think about eight, nine years later, after finishing this advertising thing, I wanted to do was corporatize my business. So I went to a place called Dubai and I set up a film company there and uh, a corporate communication company. And we started doing film photography and a little bit of branding work. And that kind of made sure that I had a system, I had a team which was working and I wasn't interested in expanding the business. It was making sure that, you know, certain amount of money was coming in and gave me the freedom to go do what I do, what I did, you know, whether it was Bhopal or working with that funding project, community issues, you know, uh, in terms of education programs I set up, uh, photography I was teaching, uh, working with kids in various conflict areas. So I think that is where the shift started happening. And as I started doing more and more work, which was, I would say more on in the art space where uh, people like my work, uh, you know, sometimes it's uh, not very sexy, uh, you know, like Bhopal is not sexy. Nobody's going to fund a 40 foot container traveling across the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are other stuff which I would do with art or publishing that kind of what I would say would uh, cross fund it. So that is the balance what one was, one, one was working through, you know. Now, I also know you have spent more than two decades teaching photography to children in various parts uh, of the country. I don't think our audience, uh, not all our audience knows about that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, I do something called Express Aspire. So these are workshops. Obviously, they started about, you know, I guess 25 odd years back. And these were uh, working with uh, children in conflict. So conflict is not necessarily, I mean, uh, working in Afghanistan, working with the, where the conflict was uh, educational girl children, working in uh, East Africa with albino children, because there are a lot of albino killings there, working in uh, uh, Jordan uh, in Palestinian camps, or working in Delhi in a Bangladesh Iraq pickers colony. So for me, the conflict is really about this whole children caught in the middle of this whole uh, you know, uh, survival and not able to uh, do what children do, you know, go to school and uh, play and have fun. So for me, the photography was not really about making them into photographers, but it was more of an empowerment exercise where uh, they would have 10 days of great fun and uh, we raise money for them post, uh, you know, the workshops. Uh, so I had 50 cameras you'd go with and do these workshops and uh, through an NGO or to a church group or something. And uh, then I would take those images back. And fortunately, I have some very rich friends who are bankers and stuff like that. And they would do little exhibition in a dinner party. And you know, uh, people would spend $100, $200 per print. So uh, that money would go back to the school or the NGO. So it was just a small model. I was not interested in finding sponsors and running around CSR programs and all that, because I just don't have a headspace for that. You know? Thank you. Thank you. That is, uh, that's, I think that'll be very inspiring for our students to hear that there is a way you can balance it. 
uh, and the heart can take over the mind and yet you can still pay your bills and, and carry on and carry on with your passion. I think uh, you have to be passionate, uh, you know, as an artist. Um, how do you see uh, an artist and at their role as a social change maker? So whether it is photography or art or um, fashion or textile or whatever, how do you see artists' role? Yes, you see, I give you a very uh, one example. You, uh, some of you, I mean, when you saw that film with those big black and white portraits, I went on that because I really love traveling. I've driven, I've been to a lot of places around the planet. And I was on a World War II road coming from Kunming into Upper Burma into Upper Assam. And I met this community there. It was Buddhist, it was, uh, you know, there was a dying community, there were very few people, 1500 of them left there. And so it was very exotic for me as a photographer, what was the first thing you do? You go do those great portraits and then you go back to uh, your part of your civilization and you do these great exhibitions and everybody's falling all over that. Oh my God, look at this community and you did great pictures and all that. But you know, this is where you have to question yourself that are you ready to take that route or are you gonna do something else about it? For me, of course, with learning, uh, you know, I didn't start that day one. So I got involved with the community. You know, I, I've spent, I guess, 12, 15 years with that, that community where we helped set up a small ecotourism project there. Uh, you know, I helped build a monastery which added income to, uh, to the families there. This was a village of about 200 of them, 150 of them actually. Uh, you know, we set up uh, education program, uh, we revived. So when I was at Vienna talking at the, uh, at the uh, TEDx talk there, post that I got people who were interested in collaborating and reviving textile from uh, the, uh, that village. So funding that is. Uh, so, the thing is that uh, I didn't go out there just that oh, I'm gonna make pictures. You know, the whole idea was that what is that capacity building? You know, how do you sustain something? Uh, you know, I don't have the checkbooks to write for, uh, you know, uh, uh, for let's say communities, but I think you do have the power of as, as a creative person, you can take your images beyond making exhibitions out of it, beyond making books out of it. Because I think there is, there is, a lot of space it all depends how many antennas are up of yours and what is connecting you because if you're just going to get lost into that one one space so i found this thing i'm going to make a picture i'm going to make an exhibition i'm going to sell my pictures or whatever you know somehow that that's not really exciting for me <laughs> okay thank you my next question um summer is how do you connect uh, art to sustainability and I think I would like to say here that sustainability is a very misunderstood word uh, I think most people think you plant a tree you save a little bit of water don't run the tap that's sustainability you put a solar panel my god you've done it all so yes sustainability in architecture is different but I think sustainability is something which spills over into every in all our lives into every profession for that matter so in fashion, it may be about uh, sustaining clusters, weaving clusters, or maybe recycling fabrics, or not wasting, not using paper. Um, in art, it could be something else. In, in a larger way, it's about holistically being somebody who believes in sustain. That's how you live. So what is it to how do you connect art and sustainability? Yeah, so like the example I just gave, I think, uh, you know, I mean, my father, uh, you know, he's, uh, well, he's no more, but, you know, as an economist, I used to hear from him sustainability while growing up and, you know, it, it this thing creeped into what I call as today's corporate world. You know, you do a social media post and you write sustainability on that, you write on issues which there's no clue about what sustainability is, but okay, I mean, that's the language. It's, it's great that people are thinking about it. Now, how do you go and plug yourself into something which is gonna have an impact beyond your own self mileage, you know, which is about the money you will make or the fame you want to do or the exhibition you want to create. I think it's really, really critical that, you know, when you work with, uh, uh, you know, on any issue, how can you involve yourself in connecting that community to larger, whatever that world is, you know, whether helping the textile loom owner to go and market that piece of fabric or whether it's uh, the, the place where they're living and it doesn't have any water system, how can you bring, you know, knowledge, you know, you bring other people to come and plug in there. The reason I'm saying this is that as, as, as an artist, when you go and work in these areas, you can see the gaps, you can see the holes where everything is falling apart. 
And uh, but you are very privileged because you, know, you come urban, you speak the language, you travel, you've seen, you're on the net, all that stuff. Why not give some of your time into doing something which becomes, you know, which benefits the community? I think, you know, that is really what it is all about. Because as I said, you know, we don't have, I mean, most of us don't come from that privileged background where we can sign checks, but uh, we definitely have a mind here and we know where those dots need to be connected. So, you know, I, I keep it really simple. You know, I'm, I'm not a policy guy. I'm not a social sector guy. I'm not from development space. But, uh, you know, if your antennas are up, as I said, you will always find room to connect. And I think that's really a very important thing as a creative person, because you are able to go there. You know, if you're an office goer, you're not exposing yourself going in the middle of wherever that is. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and you can apply that on anything, whether it's education. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of issues all around how do you sustain them become part of it become part of the solution rather than just become a documenting guy who's just busy making pictures out of them you know thank you yes that makes so much sense somebody uh, in our audience wants to know what role can an artist play uh, a photographer or a painter in making india green but i think you just did answer that it's about uh, getting involved and making a difference so green really is is a word for making it sustainable for whatever whether it is that village or it is those children that you were teaching to make them self-sufficient to make a change somewhere at every level so i'm hoping you have answered uh, and, and you, if you want to talk a little bit further how do you would you would an artist make india green please uh, go ahead Sorry. Uh, is there something you'd like to add to how can an artist make yeah, India green? Yeah, so, you know, okay, so here it is. Uh, let's just simplify it. You know, green is color, right? Uh, green is environment, but green is light to live a better life, right? So we don't have stop signs. You don't have red lights. So think of green, how you can apply your this, this idea about making things green. You know, get out of this space that it's only about, you know, saving that tree, you know, you'll miss the forest, you know, this, this entire experience you need to, you know, you, you, need, you need to keep in your mind as, as an artist, you know, don't get caught up into, and I, I see I, other thing I'll talk about, like, as an artist, I mean, you know, we were talking earlier about that, why public art projects? Uh, I personally believe that a lot of work which goes in what I call as white tube uh, gallery syndrome, where, you know, you go to this beautiful gallery, you have a great show. I mean, I understand, you know, there's commerce involved, there are galleries, there are artists, there are curators, collectors, all that stuff I understand. But, you know, whatever you are talking there, you are not, uh, you're not, everybody knows that. You know, when I go and let's say I'm talking about, uh, let's say uh, I do a piece of work which is around uh, human trafficking, for example. Now, I can go into this gallery and I can do this great print or picture or sculpture or whatever it is. Everybody knows about it. What you need to do is take that message and put it outside this gallery space, where, whether you want to create awareness, whether you create education, where you want to create empowerment, you know, I mean, that is what really creativity is all about, because unfortunately, you know, as a creative person, I know that, you know, the DNA is full of insecurity and failures and you know if people don't like my stuff and all that and you know that that destroys half of your sleep in any case you know whether you acknowledge it or not that's different but i think creative people suffer from you know that insecurity that's what makes you what you are otherwise we are mathematician because you know that logic where it'll end two plus two is going to be four no matter what uh, but i think as, as as a creative person you have those fears but you also have the opportunity to, to create solutions and why not take your this great blessing you have, you know, this great privilege or whatever this creativity, you know, why not apply it and, you know, share it in public space, especially in a country like India, you know, we are, we are like, you know, a dot of those people who go to those art exhibition galleries. I've been part of that myself, but what about taking that and putting it in a larger space? And that's where everything can come in. Even the craftsmen can come into it. The community can come into it. And that is what sustainability is, you know, how do, how do you empower, you know? Fantastic. That, that's a lot of food for thought. Um, tell me, how do you feel the pandemic has affected the creative community? Do you think um, it has challenged the artists or do you think it's been a blessing in some way? Yeah, I think uh, it's been really, really challenging for young artists. You know, I mean, I can't imagine how many people, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking when I think of it. 
I mean, I do a lot of mentoring work with young people. And uh, when I see their work and then I see the struggle they have, uh, because they are not able to put themselves out there for obvious reasons, the way the economy is or the way, uh, you know, the entire art business is there or the photography business is there, where you just don't have the space to showcase your work. Galleries, unfortunately, will always work with the usual suspects, you know, the collectors will always go for the usual suspects, you know, so it's like a tight tight ring and there's nobody's allowed in there, you know, because, uh, and the other guys are struggling and we keep saying that, hey, how come there's no new stuff coming out? Of course it won't come out because we're all sitting so tightly and not letting the new guys in. And I also understand that, you know, because there are very, you know, very strong commercial reasons. You know, you set up a gallery, you cannot just open a gallery and just pick up stuff from the street because you got to sell it finally. So I understand, you know, the, the position a lot of them come from, but I think uh, this whole COVID situation has done uh, amazing, uh, at least reset in my own head, is that, you know, the days of that individuality is over. You know, this last one year has shown it doesn't matter how much of a big rock star you might be, but who cares? Nobody cares about, you know, uh, it doesn't matter, whatever. And you can be, yes, you can be important because you have uh, lots of money or lots of name or lots of whatever, you know, your collectors and all that. But I think uh, it has given such a huge jolt to the establishment at every level, whether it's, uh, you know, being COVID positive to the biggest rock star, to the, you know, it's a great leveler. And I think that's been the, I think that's the best part of it. Uh, I, I wish I could have solutions for new artists, but I would say that, you know, that gap has come down because now you just need to work on it to get yourself up there. But the guys who've been sitting on the high horses, you know, it has come to a great level now, you know. I couldn't agree with you more, honestly. I mean, COVID has made it so clear to everybody that we're all the same. I mean, it doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank, you can still get COVID and you can still die. And that's the reality of it. You know, it isn't going to take you to another planet. And which is why all the more reason this planet has to be looked after, has to be nurtured, has to be taken care of. Um, we have an interesting question here. We've all been noticing a certain kind of democratization of art, especially photography in the recent times. The platforms and social media has given everyone equal opportunity, uh, which were otherwise limited to fewer. Do you see anything changing in terms of competition and quality? Do you foresee a certain kind of churning happening that something will eventually emerge and art will find solutions to deal with the real pro problems the world is facing? Yeah. It's a lot of questions, so you may want to say something. Yeah, so I've always believed that, you know, people used to say photography is like the ultimate democratic, whatever art form. It wasn't actually, you had to be, I keep saying this, that you had to be either a professional or amateur or a rich guy is the only reason why you picked up a camera. But when digital came, it kind of demolished all those, whatever those forts you were sitting inside. Uh, I think the best thing it has done is it has given a space where you can be anything. You don't have to worry about technology. You don't have to worry about how to load my film. And, you know, things have just become so simple. You can do the same thing on, on, on your phone today. And I, I personally very strongly believe that that has been probably the best thing. You know, unfortunately, it's taken a, a lot of jobs from professional photographers. But I think it has that created that level field, whatever playing field, which has basically created a space where everybody has a voice. And because of social media, you know, because so much of noise, like people keep saying, oh, there's so much of noise, you know, where do I put my pictures? Billions of photos come out every day, blah, blah, all that stuff. But what I believe is that, you know, in that noise, there is possibility that this, these are like, uh, you know, platforms like Insta and so many other ones, where if you have something, you keep building upon it and you'll get spotted. Otherwise, can you imagine 10 years, 20 years back, you trying to get into a gallery as a photographer, not a chance, you know, nobody's gonna look at you because, you know, either the market didn't exist or they were too busy with the, the regular guys, you know? Uh, so I think what has it has done is it has brought again to that same thing, what we talked about, what COVID has done, that we are just sitting in the same space. Now it's your hard work and the talent, and maybe you have the eye or you have something different to say, that'll make it happen for you. Uh, something I've heard uh, you say often and you quote it is that artist is trapped in numbness. Um, would you like to elaborate? Yeah, I think uh, what really bothers me and bothers about, you know, about myself also is that uh, once you have figured out 
your your skills you've figured out your tools you've figured out that language and you've figured out that gallery and that collector and that publisher and whatever you want to call you know there's it's it's quite numbing i think you know because uh, you are on that track and then you're just going on and on and on and i find that you know it's it's, it's kind of a very I would say it's a paradox of, you know, when you think about that as a creative person, your hunger level, everything just becomes so, so numb, I think. Uh, that's the reason I really love looking at young people's work because it's just so much of energy in there. You know, they may not be commercially successful, but they have something so much more to say. I'm not interested in going and seeing same museums again and again and same galleries again and again. And you know it was going to come out. But they don't, it's so predictable. You know, it's just become, you know, my work comes out. Most of people would know that what kind of work I do, you know, and it's, it's just so boring and so dull. Uh, and now there's not even cocktail parties. Otherwise, people are just going for free wine. You know? So that has also gone, thankfully. You know? uh, but I, I think uh, the, the hunger, unfortunately, turns into numbness. And that is really very unfortunate in a place like, especially like a place like India, because, you know, we are very small market for art and uh, any creative uh, practices. And I think uh, that just defeats. And that's the reason why we don't have any, you know, major, I mean, places like Iran and Pakistan and, you know, smaller places, more art goes internationally out of Nigeria then a billion something we are you know we just in our own little swimming pool we just keep going making circles in there and thinking that okay we are creating a new rocket but unfortunately not you know do you think um, and and from my experience i feel the social media is uh, is a whole new um, world and it's given just a lot i mean there, there can be the negatives of it but i think it's given a lot more ex uh, scope of expression uh, to young people. In fact, during the Mahotsa, we are running this um, green photography challenge and uh, we are going to rope you in to help us with the jury, but there's some incredible stuff which has come in from, from young kids and I'm just, you know, I'm just blown away looking at it. So I, do you think that social media is uh, a positive uh, or is it a negative? From no, an artistic I, point of view. Yeah, no, I think social media, we all know, you know, there are all sides to it. But as a creative person, all of a sudden, you have a platform to share, showcase your work, which didn't happen earlier. You know, even when, let's say, internet started off, you used to have websites. Who cares about websites? You know, who's going to go to your website? But uh, you have these platforms where you can share. And like I always say that, you know, if you have the right noise, uh, you know, there's somebody who's going to find you. You know, so and that right noise means that what kind of talent and hard work you put behind it. Uh, you know, it's it's it, it can't work. Laziness never worked. Doesn't matter whether you were painter or whether you're sitting on 25th century. You know, I mean, you gotta work for it, of course. You know. Okay, makes sense. There's a couple of questions on um, textile. I think I, that's for another day, guys. Uh, I will answer that some other time. Uh, any more questions here uh, for summer? Would you like to tell us a little bit about the Red Balloon Initiative? I think that is something everybody would like to know about. Yeah, so I think it came to a point where, you know, these uh, photo workshops where I was working with kids. Um, and I think that little realization that, uh, okay, you know, I can keep having fun, they can keep having fun. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not turning them into photographers in any case, you know, I mean, they come from, unfortunately, from a very, very, uh, you know, uh, struggling uh, survival, basically. Uh, so it came to a point where I thought, why not create a platform? And it's not an NGO, uh, you know, create a platform where you can bring creative people to work with children. And uh, that is how it started, the exercise started. Uh, I basically got, uh, uh, and you know, I have a great team with me, uh, you know, who are actually big rock stars in their own, in, in their own world. Uh, they have managed to create this programming where we are, what we are working towards is leadership. And when I say leadership in children, we are talking about. Now, you know, this is, I mean, I, I'll just deconstruct it. Typically in today's time, uh, 
one biggest struggle I think parents are having, children are having, you know, whether it's digital noise or whether it's uh, uh, screen time or whether uh, how your personalities are developing because of you don't have any human interaction and how it's really affecting your, your personality, your anger issues, all that stuff, you know, issues like empathy, you know, all, you know, issues where you are just not interested in the outside world. And it's, it's really worrying because uh, I think, and also, you know, empathy can't be taught in schools. You know, you don't have a, a textbook or exam, you know, I mean, how do you create? Uh, so the way we work is we basically let children identify these dozens of issues which we've worked with. So it can be anything from, it can be as basic as bullying in the classroom in school, or you want to work on environment, or you want to work on some anti-trafficking, you want to, you know, so you want to, so we do it online, we do it on ground also. Uh, and what we do is we bring in uh, partners where they're creative people who come in there and they work with these children. And it's a proper program for, you know, number of weeks, there are different levels of it. And uh, kids basically go through the exercise and uh, you know they, you know what we are talking about advocacy. They basically take these causes, issues, and they put it out in public domain. Whether it's a play or whether it's so creative stuff, whether it's design, art, performance art, whatever, those are just tools. But what we are really working is that children actually take these issues and how they amplify it out there. And uh, that is what leadership, you know, at least we believe in, you know, because I, I really very strongly uh, feel that, uh, you know. I mean, my generation, I, I really I really believe my generation has really failed the, what is happening right now too. Uh, you know, my parents gave this planet in a very uh, normal way. And, um, you know, we just took it to a whole different level of consumption and destruction and disrespect and whatever it is. And, uh, you know, we keep blaming the kids that, oh, put off the lights and do this, but they have seen us do this. You know, don't throw your plastic bottle there, don't do, but they have seen doing, us doing that. And, you know, I come from an analog life, you know, I don't come from a digital space. So I've seen when the, we were still going through the socialism and, you know, less was more and valuing people and your family values, whatever that was. Uh, but kids haven't seen that. And that's what I'm handing over to them. And then I'll keep blaming actually, you know, so I owe it to them. And I think, you know, I see Red Balloon, a space where you're basically creating those empathetic leaders, you're creating those young minds where they can hopefully go back to what we unfortunately lost, you know. And uh, to, to add to that, Samar, you know, as Indians, we, uh, we've grown up uh, being conservative. We did not throw away everything. Our grandparents reused, recycled. It was metal utensils. You passed on your uh, T-shirt or kurta, whatever, to, the, to your sibling. They passed to the next generation. You know, we were completely uh, sustainable in every way as, as a culture. I don't know why we're busy aping the West and we've forgotten where we come from. So if we just go back to our roots, truly, I think uh, that really would be enough. Uh, there's an interesting uh, question from somebody uh, from Pakistan. I hope our future generation and your work uh, is in Red Balloon is beautiful. Do you plan to impact and connect across South Asia and uh, connections of different cultures across boundaries? Would you like to answer that? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the idea behind uh, Red Balloon is really uh, one is that it doesn't work with, uh, there's, there's no, you know, the best thing about art or creativity is that it doesn't discriminate, you know, everybody's creative. And, uh, you know, you can fail in math because you don't have a very strong left brain, uh, but we all born with a right brain. Unfortunately, you know, we go to schools and colleges and they inject you with all this chemistry and whatever else is there. Uh, by the way, I was a big failure there. But uh, what I, I believe is, uh, you know, because there is, uh, we work with privileged, underprivileged kids, we work in all kinds of situations. And you know, when I talk about uh, creating those future leaders, that is what leadership is. When you talk about empathy, you talk about inclusion, you talk about tolerance, these are things unfortunately are not really practiced. Well, at least my generation is not practicing. Look at the mess we are left all around us, you know? So I think that when you bring kids into issue-based with these tools, which are fun, you know, being a filmmaker, you pick up a camera and you do your campaign, whatever that is, what have, and of course, under guidance of, you know, very good uh, mentors, what you are doing is you are creating those children, they are looking, they're you know, more sensitive towards, and if you're a sensitive human being, 
then borders don't matter. You know, unfortunately, borders we make in our own heads and then we want to draw lines around it and build whatever walls you want to do around us. So I think if we can keep that purity of what we all are born with, which unfortunately on this life or treadmill, we kind of all lose it. You know, and there are people who actually are very sensitive. So why not have more of those? You know, they manage to sustain themselves and, you know, save themselves from all the madness around it. So let's just make sure that the kids are, they can more of these children who are going to be the tomorrow's adults, they can carry that sensitivity, you know. And I, I would like to say something to all the people who are listening that, you know, each one of us can do this. What Samar is talking, um, each one of us uh, can encourage just a few more and a few more. And that's how, you know, that is, it's a ripple effect. That's how it's going to grow. Um, somebody wants to know how has your life been affected on a personal level working with the children um, that, that you teach photography to? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I was parallelly working in, uh, you know, film and uh, corporate communication and living a, that other life where, uh, you know, you're basically you're spoiled. And then when you go to uh, communities where resources are really, you know, at the bottom, uh, difficult places to get to uh, survival. You can see it's you know I think it's it's a it's an amazing uh, recheck on reality. Uh, you know, of course, you know I live in India. I travel all over South Asia, so it's not like I'm far removed. I'm not living in a bubble, you know, where I don't know what else is happening outside. But uh, I think when you work with kids, you realize a couple of things. You realize the biggest thing you actually realize is that the kindness. It's just the most amazing thing. Each time I work with kids, they just melt my heart, you know, and I mean, I, I don't have words for that. It's just the most beautiful thing. And I don't have kids. You know? <laughs> and but yet you appreciate them more than I think some of us who do. Um, somebody is asking, uh, is it through social media? And what about people who don't have access or means? Can they... Uh, can artists help? I'm not sure what this question is, but I think they sort of don't have access to social media. But, uh, you know, I don't think you need access to social media to express uh, uh, creatively. I, I don't, I mean, Samar, would you like to answer? Yeah, so, yeah, so I want to just talk about, uh, you know, I have a lot of young photographers who come and they want to go and study photography and spend their parents' money and whatever that is. Uh, you, know, un you know, unless you have, you know, a lot of money, that's different. Uh, but then you don't have the hunger and I don't think I'm going to do a great job. I, mean, I don't want to write off everyone. But what I believe is that, let's say as a photographer, you know, don't waste your time in going to photo schools. You know, learn your basics, go to a photography place where they can teach you the basics. But, you know, the real thing is going to come out is, is go and study history, study philosophy, do other stuff, because that is what's going to influence your work. It is not going to be that how beautifully I have lit up this piece of pie because uh, it doesn't matter. Pie doesn't work, right? You, you need to keep reinventing, rethinking. And these processes are all going to come from what you read, what kind of friends you have, what kind of places, you know, get out of the comfort zone where you know that, okay, this, this is what I was talking about, the numbness. That numbness happens at high end once you've arrived in that space. But unfortunately, even when we are starting, it's human nature that you want to be in that safety zone each time. You know, you want to be with the, you know, the predictable spaces, places, thinking, people, professions, whatever that is. Uh, go, go spend a, you know, day in front of one single painting and try to, you know, deconstruct that. And, uh, you know, that's going to give you more education than trying to figure out that how do I light up the spy or whatever, you know. It's, it's for your personal growth. It's, it's not about, I'm not talking about, you know, how successful you're going to be commercially. Uh, I think it's a lot to do with your politics, you know, uh, what you're aware of, what kind of stuff you read, what kind of people you hang out, what kind of creative uh, uh, community you are, uh, you know, uh, exchanging ideas with. You know, these are the things which is what makes you because I think, I mean, I don't know what I went to film school and design school and art school. I went to so many different, I kept dropping out of, I don't think I carried anything from there other than some great friendships. Uh, but what really made me as a person, whatever little bit I know, is because of the exposures you have, you know, the experiences you have, those are the stories, which is what you bring into what you do. You know, I'm not qualified to run Red Balloon technically because I'm, I'm not even a parent, you know, I'm not a tech guy, you know, uh, I'm not into education. I didn't even go beyond high school, you know, so uh, 
but how am I doing it? The reason I'm doing it is because the experience and the exposure and the kind of people you associate yourself with, that is how, and what we talked earlier about what COVID has done, this is what I mean, the idea of individuality is so dead because it has just created monsters. Because if you have great success, great money, I mean, those are the things which you want to measure up. Look at it. Where did we land up with that? You know, it, it's about collective. You know, it's about working with people who are around you or find those new set of people. And you'll be amazed at how beautifully you can create some, and you'll make a better life for yourself more than the money, actually, you know. Um, we have a question here, Rupali. Um, your question is, why are we communicating in English? I don't think, um, and I'm going to answer that because... Um, Rupali, I think creativity, ya art, ya music, uh, ya photography ki koi language nahi hoti hai. So English is just a medium we are using today, uh, but I think it has to spill beyond and what Samar already said, you have to get out of that box. So feel free to communicate in Hindi or Punjabi or Gujarati or uh, uh, any other language, you know, uh, the idea is you have to be expressing and it's, it's just a medium. I think languages are not relevant here. Uh, somebody else um, is asking, how can you use art um, in to, for larger issues which will impact the future generation? And I think this is going to be our last question, guys, because we are now running short of time. Samar? Yeah, so uh, using art for larger impact. Well, I think creativity has that, that power, I think, to uh, convert, you know and it can be anything it can be music it can and we live through it we all live through it you know it's not just about some beautiful picture you know uh, we we live through creativity whether the films you watch the uh, the poster you see on the wall or you know the kind of books you read these are all things is what makes us what we are and, and i think it's really important to keep as i keep saying to I say that to myself too, and I say that to a lot of young people is that your antennas need to be up, you know, don't get focused and, you know, obsessed with just because you've got this great paint brush skill and you want to just keep doing that, you know, go into these spaces where you have no idea, go to places where you have no idea how to speak, you know, very rightly, the person who was talking earlier, you know, uh, language is creativity, it's not language about comfort that I can speak in Gujarati or English or Hindi or whatever it is. I think it's, it's, it's all about, you know, going in places where you have no idea, but the best part is because you are, you are blessed with this creativity where you can do something with it. And I, I, I think that is, and unfortunately, not many people carry that, you know, if you have that in you, and I, I don't mean that, that you, 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 if you're a surgeon and you can't be creative, you know, you can be anything. Uh, you may be a great chef, you may be a good uh, flower arranging person, you know, uh, that is what creativity is finally all about, you know. Lovely, I think it has been wonderful and I would like to say one last thing um, is that I don't believe uh, joy has uh, any color, any uh, language, any medium. So whether it is art or music or dance or photography or fashion or textile or sustainability for that matter. I mean, you know, it's a matter of a lot of like-minded people coming together and uh, saying this, conveying the same message. And that, and that is exactly what we are trying to do here. I have a few friends on this session who are in the music space and somebody who does art and somebody else who does textile. And they're all conveying the same message at the end of the day. So it's how we want to take that message forward and how much we want to do uh, with it. I do want to thank Dr. Malik for being here. And Summer, we'll ask you to uh, give us a last closing something inspiring uh, that a thought that you'd want to leave uh, with your audience today. And thank you for being with us today, thanks. Oh, well, I don't know how I'm gonna inspire, but uh, I'll just say is that, you know, as a creative person, stop fearing failures, because if you're gonna get caught up in that, uh, believe you me, you're not gonna go anywhere because you're, you are just blocking yourself. Uh, and also it's like, don't go into, you know, let's say as a photographer, uh, or as an artist or painter or whatever, don't look at where is this work gonna be showcased? How I'm gonna sell it? Who's gonna look at it? Who's gonna write about it? You know, you are what you're doing is you're blocking yourself. That is not pure. You need to really work with yourself. It's all inside. I understand this social media noise and the likes and all that drama, which is all around us, but you know, to create something which is gonna be truthful, you have to like that first before anyone else and don't get 
tempted and thrown off by all these attractions and distractions around, you know? So it's, it's really simple. I mean, that's what I tell to myself and to young people, you know? Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Samar. And we are going to reach out to you to help us as the jury for our uh, fabulous uh, photography work. Yeah, that thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Malik. Thank you.